the title on a little bit from what it was down to. So I am going to talk about what we talk about when we talk about political settlements. But given that you had the paper to read, I'm going to spend less time. Um, I'm going to, in some senses, try to answer that in the first five minutes and look a little bit about the relationship between peace settlements and political settlement and share a little bit some of our latest thinking around that and how peace settlements shape the political settlement. Uh, I'm going to try and make little bits of it a tiny bit interactive, but also would just encourage you if you're really not getting something along the way or have a burning question, just um, let's just see how that goes. Raise your hand and we'll see if we can deal with it. Um, so what I wanted to do was just begin with, and this was really just to get a quick response from you, I was going to just begin with a series of quotes that I've taken fairly eclectically from um, both development publications and meetings that we've had even in the last year and also from conflict resolution things. So the first one was actually a couple of years ago I was training um, uh, Norwegian diplomats in conflict resolution and the reason they were having the training was that Norway has two key problems to its foreign policy. One, promotion of human rights and secondly mediation and peace processes as a small unaligned nation. And both of these they see as contributions to the common good, and they will say quite openly to you, Norway's foreign policy is to promote the common good of mankind. And they were very aware that potentially their human rights policy had points of collision course with their mediation policy. And when she was introducing me, and I, my heart sank actually because it looked like I was maybe going to solve this, and of course I knew I wasn't. She said, we say we support, why are we having this meeting? Um, we say we support civil society, but in reality we support some civil society and not others. We say we're against amnesty, but in reality we're against some amnesties and not others. And we're happy that we can't really explain these choices. We don't really have a rational choice model to explain how we're making these decisions, and we, want, we feel we need to have. The second one is taken from one of the different political settlement publications. To understand development, we must understand the politics that shape it. This very much aligns with Sam's starting point, uh, the idea that development is politics. The third one is taken from, the, there were three major UN reviews this year about joined up thinking. I always think that's quite funny, you have joined up thinking, so you have three different reviews on how to do joined up thinking. <laughs> kind of sets where it's at. Um, but the one that was the most interesting in my view was the UN Peacekeeping Operations Report. The other one was the Women, Peace and Security Review, and the other one was the Peace Building Architecture Review. Um, so the UN Secretariat must ensure that its situation analysis is driven not by assessments of what the political market will bear, either in the host country or at United Nations headquarters, but by an understanding of the situation, needs, opportunities and constraints. This looks like an anti-politics statement, but it's actually in the context of a report that's very much about saying we need to be much politically smarter, but we don't necessarily just stop at that. I have two more. And I'm sorry, we, there's meant to be curtains at the back and I can't make the screen easier to read because, um, of course, as it always happens with these things, the curtain's critically broken Friday. So there's a tension, this was a different um, a governance person in the meeting, there's a tension between implicitly criticising country officers and those in DFID that are not working on big transformational things and recognising that as donors our scope is limited, often we can't influence the big politics and need to understand our own role and influence. When can we be influential? When are we just a size show? Um, so that was really in ways talking about this sort of feeling that I think sometimes political settlements put you in where um, if you're not influencing the actual political settlement, you're kind of fiddling around the edges, but actually can international actors fiddle influence the big political settlement or do they have to use these subtle ways of doing it? And then this was actually from a workshop we did in the British International Studies Association just on Thursday, Jonathan Joseph, a kind of a sort of critical IR perspective. He said we're in a clash of paradigms moving away from the old liberal epistemic framework, so in other words the type of um, maybe new institutionalist thinking towards wicked problem-driven approaches, the idea that everything's very complex and interrelated and causes all sorts of unintended consequences. Embracing failure um, is part of the new paradigm. The emergence of the term <coughs> resilience maps onto this. It says we have to accept that we can't control the bigger picture, can't intervene coherently, knowledge is uncertain and untrue, and everything is contestable. Therefore, we have to work on micro level of the micro level of fostering resilience and adaptability. So not not sort of doing 
big interventions anymore, but supporting um, people. And that uh, we'll express it in positive terms as empowerment, hybridity, capacity building, or assisting communities to be resilient. Governance by getting people to govern themselves. So no big governance interventions, supporting people to be resilient, adaptable, to deal with change. And what I really want to talk about is um, how, do, how do we negotiate inclusion? And there are two levels of inclusion here um, that we're talking about. And it was very much present, I think, in Sam's talk. One, the kind of elite forms of elite inclusion, the stakeholders and the power holders, and how does that part of, of a bargain in a state become more inclusive? And the second level, that would be, if you like, a horizontal elite inclusion. The second would be a more vertical inclusion. How do other social forces and interests and actors get included in that? And underline, I think, um, some of the assumptions around the work that we were funded to do were that there was a a, sometimes a tension between that. And I think that actually came through quite strongly in the first presentation. Um, so partly, um, sorry, I'm not quite timing my points with what I'm saying. So what I wanted to talk about was how is, how is inclusion negotiated in the space of peace processes and um, post-conflict or the post-conflict orders that result from them. Uh, and why do we, why are we doing this? So we're not trying to equate peace settlements with political settlements. We're accepting the kind of definitions of what political settlements are as these bargaining processes. But if you look at, say, lists of fragile and conflict-affected states, and I actually turned up the Fragility Index one this morning, and out of their first 26 states, which is their, their red <laughs> and their orange category, and um, all of them except arguably one, and that one was Nigeria, have had structured, formalised peace processes that have attempted, with huge amounts of intervention resources from both donors, from regional organisations, from international organisations, a structured reconfiguration of their political and legal and constitutional order to create a new political settlement. So insofar as this is a very um, key attempt, we had three questions at the heart of the project that DFID really gave us. One, how are political settlements created? How, secondly, how do internal actors try to shape them? And thirdly, how do, with a view to inclusiveness, how do external actors try to shape them? So we really have said, well, actually, if you're looking at where this happens and where political settlements are attempted to be created in these quite big bang approaches, it's in these peace settlement and processes. And let's understand how projects of inclusion and exclusion, new forms of inclusion, new forms of exclusion, um, navigated and negotiated in that space. Um, to give a sense of the global practice since 1990, which is sort of where we start looking at, because things change quite radically post-Cold War for complicated reasons I'll not go into, around 1,400 peace agreements of different forms and around 112 conflicts, if, if we think of there being sort of 190-odd states in the world. It's a very large-scale global practice. As you can see from the numbers, there's very complicated documentary and peace negotiation histories with multiple agreements and phases of these processes. Um, they're critical to development of this if added in the state fragility index statistic. And also this is really not said a lot. It's a quite a successful practice in terms of reduction of deaths and conflict figures and data are very, very contested. But insofar as there is a trend, and in fact some data sources that seem to say the other thing when you look at them closely, around 75% of these conflicts and peace processes significantly reduce deaths and conflict over a period of at least five years, which is generally taken to be a measure of success. Um, so, and they are one of the main ways of ending conflict. We know from data on how conflicts terminate. So it's a kind of slightly unsung success story. However, um, they're also seen, I think, in terms of as not being successful necessarily in tracking through to a stable state formation and good governance. So it's a specific type of success perhaps more a negative peace success than a positive peace success. And actually, I think this is where the world of development and conflict resolution connect a bit, but um, there's a feeling that there's a, a lot of disillusionment, that we've been in these various transitional processes since 1990, that we actually, some of them are really hard to bring to con conclusion. Um, the figures, for example, for deaths and conflict and reduction in violence overall globally are being completely reversed purely by the Syrian conflict and the scales of deaths in that has, through one conflict, <coughs> reversed the downward trend in deaths and conflict. Um, and also there's a feeling that some of the transitions that looked like they'd been quite successful 
like South Africa, like Burundi, that had these periods of relative success in lots of different fronts, can undo almost overnight in ways that are quite hard to predict. Um, and part of it, I think, is the feeling that the state building isn't working or at least gets stuck. There's a common diagnosis, I think, coming out of these worlds that we've heard about from the development perspective. We're being outsmarted. Why are they getting stuck? It's not about often institutions which look the same, have very different outcomes, etc. We're being outsmarted by political strategic games at the local level that we don't even know are going on, much less engage effectively with. We need to respond more politically smartly. And then I think this is where the unknown piece comes in. Um, but we don't quite know what does that mean to engage politically and are the constraints on us in terms of our own baggage, whether it's the UN or the UK government, um, do they actually limit the ways in which we can <coughs> engage politically? I think actually Sam gives some really good examples of that. Um, so I wanted to start then looking, now to move into looking at what are people doing in these peace processes, what is the nature of the political settlement constructed and how does that sort of create different inclusion and exclusion games as it were. I just wanted to start a little bit from first basis around ending of conflict. Why has there been this big phenomenon? This is a little bit basic but there's sort of three things external actors can do with regard to conflict. The first one is to give war a chance and do nothing in terms of intervention, wait and see how it plays out. That phrase, give, it's a great phrase, give war a chance, is actually the name of a very famous article that really advocated for this. And it was a little bit like the dominant um, coalition theory. It's really saying that actually conflict produces winners and losers that create a greater form of stability after what comes afterwards and therefore they create the best prospects for stable settlement afterwards. Of course a lot of people that believe in peace um, say well actually let, but what is, the, what is that peace that's created after conflict. Um, gaining a little bit of traction worldwide with the so-called Sri Lanka option where you literally pull say and exclude the media, eliminate <coughs> your components with huge levels of violence and then um, uh, move forward. Um, the second option is that you intervene, not necessarily militarily, but with a whole set of force-based interventions, sanctions through to military, and do something. That involves, of course, deciding when and how you're going to intervene, having to live with other people, maybe deciding they're going to intervene too, um, and deciding that you can do something about the good outcome. And of course, there's a lot of reservations about that after um, Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and to some extent Syria has, and Libya, and, and Syria has played that out. And the third one is to promote um, and attempt to uh, negotiate a settlement. Now what I really would suggest is what drives this uh, and the practice of a negotiated settlement is that whatever the compromises, and I'm partly laying this slide out because I'm going to talk about all the compromises, whatever the compromises, moral, political, legal, future pathway dependency are of the third option, they're generally more palatable in particular to people that are pro-democracy, pro-peace, pro-human rights than either of the first two alternatives. And so in some senses that is what propels this field. Um, right, I'm not going to talk about that. The context for, if you like, trying to create a broad patterning and account of these processes across hugely different things. Our programme doesn't just focus on fragile conflict affect states, that is our main focus, but we also look at non-fragile and different settings. Um, the context is that these, this, these processes are inclusive of the main protagonist to conflict. That's actually a little bit different from what happened before the 1990s where quite often states tried to deal with conflict by dealing with the moderate brokers that were least advocating within the grouping on the other side to bring them within government to try to exclude their violent outbidders. That process changed quite radically post-1990. Um, Secondly, the, there has been a particular style of reaching agreement through formalised political agreements. Um, those formalised political agreements, in some senses, and this is a very crude generalisation, but do too have some, a common framework, which is they couple a commitment to ceasefire and end the conflict with what we could call a constitutional framework. Now, I don't mean the word constitutional as in a written constitution. I mean the word constitutional in the notion of a power map for how power is going to be held and exercised, what the political and legal institutions are going to look like. Now there's a lot of people, um, and very recently actually Mary Calder wrote an article saying we've got to separate these two things, ceasefire and conflict and constitutional power map. 
well, that's fine, but you know, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. People don't mm -hmm. sign the ceasefire until they see what they're going to get out of the settlement. So while that might be a nice aspiration, actually these things get coupled for a structural reason. That creates this sort of dynamic and three main ingredients creates very obvious consequences. Firstly, that the people at the heart of the new political settlement that are those that were most responsible for the violence and the aftermath. Um, secondly, that the formal agreements, they create compromises. So, no, so some of these are more tilted towards people winning and losing, but quite a lot of these settlements are about um, telling people they haven't lost. The example I really like to use for this was years and years ago when I was researching the Peace Agreements and Human Rights book. Um, I was in a very tiny um, UN office in Gaza and somebody said, oh, do you want to see this, the real cost of a peace deal? And it was from private eye, actually. It was a, a, a UN worker handed it to me and it started off, um, it was called the real cost of a peace deal and it was right after the war had ended. And it said, clause one, um, everybody, lost, everybody won the war. Clause two, nobody lost the war. Clause three, the KLA will be disarmed. Clause four, and rearmed, called the cost of a police force. And it went on like this. And um, then uh, it's quite funny actually because it's signed um, uh, uh, Tony, um, President Clinton, Chief Flander, because it was after the Lewinsky thing, and Tony Blair, Supreme Commander of the Universe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's probably going to come back to haunt him in a couple of weeks. But anyway. Um, so, but the point is that their compromises are written over these. Uh, and the third one is that they do combine, and you can see that in the ceasefire and power map. And part of the complexity of the compromise is they combine what you might need to do in the short term to demobilize violence and violent structures with what you would want to set up longer term institutionally. And actually, in lots of respects, the short term demands of creating peace sit quite at odds with what you might want to do long term to sustain <coughs> a more positive peace. Uh, there's, this sort of has created a whole generative literature around the dilemmas of this. And I put some of them out in slightly different works. I'm not going to go through these. We can have discussion about these, but I'm going to just talk very briefly about them. The first one is um, a notion of there's a tension between fundamentally between the power sharing forms of government, which are often not so much power sharing, but power splitting. This is the nobody won, everybody lost. You all got what you want, even though those, those things were diametrically opposed during the conflict. Um, so did everyone get what they want and how is that navigated versus the notion of accountable good government? This plays out both in the sort of conceptual political terrain. It plays out in things like you create multiple messy overlapping institutions and masses and masses of government in these peace agreements to give everybody a little slice of some institution that may not actually be a way to run the <coughs> government effectively. So there's lots of micro levels at which this plays out. Secondly, and probably most famously, the peace, so-called peace versus justice debate. Well, if you're going to bring the main protagonists into power, you don't, they don't tend to do that if it involves signing their own arrest warrants um, and committing to prison for 20 years. And uh, so do we have to, when do we compromise and what are the effects of that compromise on long-term building of rule of law? Um, return of displaced uh, is particularly an issue it, it's not talked about in the peace and justice terms, but where you've had a conflict that has used displacement as a tool of conflict and created um, more ethnic homogeneity in areas, actually return of displaced has a political consequence in terms of the head counts that people do in ethnic groups. Inclusion of women, um, and what I've called it, so I, I don't think there's an appropriate term, but I tend to use non-conflict minorities. So often the, conf the minorities in ethnic uh, and the identities at the heart of the conflict are not the only identities in, the co in it. So what happens to inclusion of women and non-conflict minorities? And although this isn't a strong peace justice dilemma, in fact, there's a lot of arguments of it's utopian to do these things, to create these border reforms of social inclusion, because it disrupts the elite deal and the elite deal making. And also I just add in that one of the dilemmas is, of course, international actors don't come in just prepared to act on policy-based evidence, but they bring their own biases. The most obvious one is a complete prohibition on changing borders and a commitment to the territorial integrity norm. So even if division of the country would maybe seem like a way you could do it, I suppose Somalia has been an example of this. Um, cost of a kind of was, although sleight of hand, they managed to um, create statehood. But that, you know, in, in both those situations, incapacity to consider um, a split up of the countries. It is a very is a norm that's not going to be trumped by showing that it would be more effective to do it a different way. Um, 
Also, international actors tend to not like group solutions like power sharing. We tend to see them as temporary, necessary evils to be moved on into a more normal framework. Um, they're committed to always having elections and putting in place democratic structures. Um, they're committed to participation. Um, we see that through the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And somebody suggests that we, we quite are quite taken with this article. This sometimes creates this peace builders contract where you get these structures and dilemmas and you get international actors just trying to do the rule of law, human rights, participation, democratic thing. But of course they know it doesn't work. So you get these subtle forms of contract where they get to do a bit of that and get local actors to play lip service to that while moving out. Well, while, while, um, while not really, while knowing that, they've also got to engage with a whole different set of realities that is maybe the political settlements, including the informal level. Um, what I wanted to do was just, this is sort of an idea that we've been playing around with and I really, in ways, seemed to me to a little bit reflect what I was hearing even from some old peace processes like Bosnia and actually most recently seeing Bosnian women engage with Syrian women. Um, but I wanted to like, slightly then reframe what I think the nature of the political settlement is that's caused in a lot, that's created in a lot of these countries. And I was going to use this term for the sake of provo provocation, but often actually what these agreements um, produce and what these negotiations produce is not a new political settlement, but something that I think is maybe better thought of as a formalised political unsettlement. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how this also has resonance at the minute in very settled state contexts. Um, so there's few, let me suggest what the ingredients of the formalized political unsettlement that's caused is. Firstly, that the conflict is translated into a new the new institutions and structures. So rather than <coughs> creating politics and political institutions and spaces as um, something new and a new political settlement, actually they're created as a much more processed type of institutional structure, spaces in which you can continue to disagree about even whether the state in its current form and territory and sets of nationhood should continue to exist at all. So very fundamental disagreement can be translated into these structures. And close of its years, it famously talked about um, war as politics with the admixture of other means. People have talked, I think, convincingly about these processes as close of its in reverse them now trying to create politics as war with the admixture of a few other institutions and means. Um, secondly, they're often presented as temporary and entered into as temporary as transitional, transitional constitutions, transitional political structures, tracks and pathways, and in practice they're very long lasting. Um, I, we look even at one of the most settled everything going for it context of Northern Ireland. We still actually um, having to have repeated peace deals to move on to the next stage. It's not being done through the business of normal politics. So this period of transition seems to be permanently with us. We never get to the end of transition. Thirdly, um, they create internationalised domestic spaces. So in very international conflicts um, that have had geopolitical dimensions like Bosnia or Afghanistan, Iraq, Actually, internationals run the country and are the power map for periods of interim um, transitional uh, um, governance. And, um, but even in really domesticized processes, internationals are everywhere and quite embedded in domestic institutions. Bosnia was again a good example where you had ethnic makeup of judges, this many Croats, Bosniak serves, <coughs> and this many internationals. And they were actually in the banking institution, in the judiciary. Etc. So these are, in ways, situations where international actors almost become domesticized, and we can't really think of them as interveners in the political settlement. They're actually part of the political settlement to some extent. And a fourth characteristic I would say is that they create institutions <coughs> and ways of doing business that are very hybrid between whether they have delivered substance of any form of liberal democracy and whether they're really institutions that are purely about process and keeping open the contested questions that have driven the conflict rather than resolving them in a political settlement. So those are what I want to suggest are the kind of characteristics of this, of if you like, the political settlements or what I'm calling the ways of formalising on settlement that take place in these in these negotiations and in the post that sort of characterise the post-conflict terrain. 
Uh, and they're, I think if I had to summarize it, it's that they create a politics that's about managing conflict and having processes of its ongoing management rather than resolving it. And I think what I want to suggest here is that it um, creates, it means that I think we have to view governance differently and the dynamics of political settlement differently. So rather than institution building and good government, I think it is about what are these processes that are created and what is this bargain and how does the balance of power need to be um, dealt with in it. Because I think really they're sustained in terms of the balance of power, and this is where Kahn's definition of political settlement institutions married with the balance of power, I think, holds in a sense. Um, and to the extent that there is a tension and everybody is trying to use the settlement to go back to their default conflict position that they really want and are engaging in the settlement to obtain in every bit the same way as they were engaging in the war to obtain, um, outsiders remain important and critical to the balance of power and whether they're prepared to stick around and leverage forms of change can be quite crucial. Uh, so what are the challenges? Conclusion, I'm actually going to sort of skip through this pretty much because um, in some senses they're obvious and they're talked about and I actually want to present a sort of what are the opportunities for forms of inclusion. The challenges of inclusion are, I think, that it creates a situation where politics continues through forms of deal making and elite de deal making. So the new settlement is often in terms of inclusion of key elites, a little bit like North suggested was a trajectory of development, but often at the expense of both wider normative commitments and wider form of social of social inclusion of groups that weren't critical to the conflict. So in other words, it's seen as creating, I think, the trade-off between elite inclusion and other forms of inclusion. Secondly, that the institutions are disproportionately <coughs> shaped and their outworking and ongoing and functionality is shaped by the ongoing struggles for power um, as people try to take back ownership, claw back <coughs> what they agreed at the moment of settlement. And um, they can also be experienced as deeply exclusionary by those of outside of the fold and outside of the elite political fold. Um, and I, in some sense, it's actually driven, underneath this, I think there's this notion on dynamic that violence pays, that to some extent, if you've gained access, you know, through the, through the your use as a violent actor, the idea that these, these processes really deliver um, based on your capacity to destabilize. If you can destabilize, then you get included. If you can't, you don't. Of course, there's more complicated stories I'm going to come to. Um, and also, I think what we see is that while the conflict often ostensibly ends, and as I said, there's a relative success story there, in fact, um, conflict persists. So we've got a measurement bit of the, conf of, the pro of our project, and one of the reasons, really, I've been sort of very taken with the measurement was I read a statistic um, ages ago about um, been reading about the El Salvador peace process. This was a very <coughs> successful process. It led to elections. People they had an unexpected outcome, but still peace sustained. The institutional reform took place. In the last year of the conflict in El Salvador, three thousand people died in the violent conflict. Three years after the successful peace accords, six thousand people died as a result of violent homicide. And this is a pattern we see everywhere. So again, if you're uh, Richard, who was here at the morning, is a critical criminologist, you know, you, you might um, think about labelling theory and criminology and whether we've really eliminated the conflict or displaced and renamed it. And yet something fundamental might have changed around the political settlement. So the conflict's present but mutates in ways that are quite complicated. Um, but what I want to suggest is that, and this is an attempt, I think, at the end, um, Sam said, well, there's these two choices and tensions in their project, and tensions maybe with where we engage between a kind of realist approach that says, let's not ask how things should be, let's ask how they are, and see what the consequences of that are, and a kind of more <coughs> idealistic, normative <coughs> approach that says, you know, how can we leverage out transformative solutions in these contexts? Um, I sense their project wants to do this too, and the fact that you've got the marriage of people within it, but of course we would kind of want to do both, right? And this is why I quite like the UN quote that I gave at the start, because we want to understand the political marketplace and engage it, but not necessarily um, submit to it completely. So how is it that you leverage change? So my suggestions here are optimistic suggestions based a little bit on 
um, what I think the opportunities of the political settlement are for leveraging broader forms of inclusion. So the first one is that um, in the negative bit of group solutions that are based around particular elites, um, there is something positive, which is political settlements discourse, I think, has been self-aware that it has, um, uh, and uh, Sam's project has tried to bring this in, but um, it has underplayed ideas and identity as a dynamic of how settlements and processes are navigated. These group-based solutions, for all their limitations and evils, underline the importance of identity and access of different ethnic and identity and political divided groups to government. And in creating a discourse of inclusion around that, in ways that liberal democratic structures actually haven't, haven't worked and don't do, even in settled contexts, they've been found it difficult to bring in different groups. Um, they, uh, these group-based solutions create opportunities for other groups, such as women, to say, well, wait a minute, if everybody's only here by virtue of a participative democracy and a numbers count, maybe we can have a different approach to quotas in this situation and not go into the liberal democratic thing about merit versus quotas because actually look nobody's here because of merit everyone's here because of who they are so why not other groups too um, but this also means that we might have to think a little bit of the resistance to short term to the short termism of group based solutions and engage with them as a longer more permanent structure and that's a challenge um, so I, I just have put in the provocative questions that I think follow from this. Do we need to understand and embrace group solutions rather than move on thinking need to replace them? Particularly where actually there doesn't seem an option for replacing them. So it was <coughs> because famously the European Court struck down the constitutional arrangements at the heart of the Dayton Peace Agreement um, on the grounds that enough time had passed and it should be individual rights now. Well, that was fine until there was no plan B, because without them, there is no central state. And in fact, without the central state, there is no equality, there is no diversity. There's the ethnically cleansed many states that the international community fought so long and hard to not have. Secondly, what I would suggest is that maybe there's, a, and I mean, I'm taking, I'm trying to find a middle road, just to be clear about what I'm doing here, and I'm not entirely optimistic. I'm trying to find a middle road between fatalistic acceptance of the negativity of these political settlements and utopian idealism about how we can suddenly transform and move beyond them. So political institutional fluidity um, and constant deal making can offer post-conflict opportunities to the marginalised. Maybe just to use a graphic example, if you think of the difficulties women have had in America, modifying equal protection clause with the stable constitutional frameworks there, and you think about these moments of opportunity like we had, um, in fact, there's a brilliant example in Sam's presentation where you had a transitional government um, in uh, Bangladesh, I think you said, I mean, I don't know this example, where suddenly there was an opportunity for women which they were in a position to seize on. Well, actually, maybe if we stop looking at all the problems and said, what are these opportunities and moments and how do we enable groups that have been excluded at the initial cut to get back in. Third, um, but <coughs> of course that then creates a provocation of only if we live with and work opportunistically to support ongoing attempts to intervene in the fluid aspects and recognise and enable groups to seize on political imagination. And that might require different ways of funding than, than donors are comfortable with. The other thing that I think they give is there are, um, and actually Catherine's going to speak in her work, I think really speaks to this. These deals have what I would call multi-polar multi reference points for legitimacy. So partly they create a form of legitimacy that says this deal is more legitimate than what came before because the fundamental dissenters from the deal before are now included and it will be able to deliver in different ways for excluded communities and that's critical to the deal and it was interesting the Rwandan example in the last thing where that has a leverage around social protection where the government can't be seen to be delivering to everyone it had reformed. However, um, international standards and norms and the rhetoric and apparatus of liberal democratic frameworks also have a legitimacy where these are seen as dirty deal making that, that groups that are excluded use to leverage entrance and in fact the legitimacy often ties to both of these things. So at the point where one sphere is delivering and the other is not, they become in dialogue with each other. That's a bit complicated, so I can explain it if you ask me questions. Um, 
So what I think it suggests <coughs> is a little bit, again, some of the job for international interveners, that actually international interveners do have to negotiate their respective legitimacy as part of the ongoing intervention, that they are part of the power map to some extent. Oh, sorry, I have one more slide that I cut. So, I mean, that's really where I'm going to leave it. I suppose just one thing I would say is that I think if you look actually, and this is a really good week to say this, if you look at the UK's constitutional settlement at the minute, and somebody said, oh, this is the first time we've had a chance to vote on the huge makeup of structure of the United Kingdom. This is in the EU <coughs> referendum, which is on Thursday. Um, since, and then, well, 21 months ago when we voted on it, about whether Scotland would secede from the UK and bring an end to the United Kingdom as we know it. And there's a sense in which, actually, some of these forms of fluidity and ongoing scene politics is an ongoing um, negotiation, not about the business of how to get X, Y, and Z done, but about who are we as a state? What, if anything, holds us together? What is our common bounded geography? What are our common bounded institutions? There's a sense in which some of this formalised political unsettlement is a little bit the new normal and starting to actually appear in um, quite settled contexts, albeit in different ways with different outcomes. So a little bit our approach, I think, to political settlement are to say, well, we actually have a wealth of experience in terms of how actors within these spaces have tried to negotiate and leverage inclusion, sometimes with success, sometimes by getting to the negotiating table, sometimes by levering change afterwards, sometimes by acting opportunistically. And we think this is actually something that we can look at a little bit in the programme. I think the papers reflect this a bit in this session to see what are the strategies and actions that worked, what were the outcomes, and um, how do we take that forward. Um, but I'm keen to at least suggest that um, there's some certain forms of opportunity in these contexts, and that maybe that is the sort of um, middle ground between fatalism and utopia. Thank you.